morning and praise the Lord. I am really excited that this morning we could uh, come back together. Uh, there is something very unique about this uh, series of meetings. Uh, we are here to uh, intensely study certain special topics on what we believe and why we believe the way we believe it. What are some of the important things which we believe and uh, why we believe the way we believe it. How can we biblically defend it? We have looked at an overview of all what we believe and uh, we have looked at some very historically important things in relation to our faith and as we continue to study it, as I reminded you yesterday, we want to study it with humility, with the spirit of grace and love and uh, also with uh, uh, introspection and reflection. That means wherever we need to have fine tuning, changes and correction, we should be willing to do that. We should not be ashamed of it. We should admit our mistakes. We should turn a new leaf, a new chapter so that the Lord would be able to continue to bless us for His uh, glory. Uh, so I am so glad that uh, the Lord has given uh, you this burden and uh, me this burden and we can all uh, come together uh, even during this day to uh, continue our study. When I was in Nigeria last year, uh, many of their sessions are very long, like uh, two to two and a half hours and all, and they tell the preacher that you can take as long as you want and you can do whatever you want, teach or talk or sing or share or exhort. It's a very long session. And I know that it is not very helpful to have, you know, two and a half long session. So I usually take an hour and hour and a half with an interpreter, then stop and then give them opportunity to ask questions or to enjoy fellowship. But I noticed something very interesting that uh, hundreds of them, in some places thousands of believers gather. And uh, they have uh, positioned, stationed uh, elders, deacons and other uh, responsible brethren with a long stick and they are you know they are all standing in different corners in different places because evidently they know that uh, people will start sleeping they will become very tired and it's very interesting that they would walk around and they will port the people who are sleeping and wake them up it, it continuously goes on it was uh, very funny to me as I was seeing it for the first time but none of them were laughing because it is a very, you know, it's a normal practice they have. So I don't think that we have assigned anybody to do that here this morning. Uh, but uh, I'm sure that the Lord will help us to uh, uh, give good attention to what uh, we are studying. Again, I want to repeat some of the things which I have been emphasizing yesterday. Our teaching, our preaching, our messages and our faith should be biblical, it should be practical, it should be theological, it should be relevant, and it should minister to the needs of the people. I very sincerely believe that we did not have that focus in the past. You know, we just uh, poured out our heart and we preached without due consideration about these things. And that is one reason probably that even though our product was very good, we were not able to sell it. I usually think of, you know, some of the uh, drugstore companies, medical representatives carrying the medicine representing their company, walking around to doctor's offices. Very good product. But if they are not able to sell it, nobody wants it, you know. If that is the situation, that is very bad. I, I, I always pray that the Lord, I don't want to be like that. I know I have a very good product, you know, in my upbringing. In the word of God, in the assembly heritage, I am very happy about that. I have a good product. Help me to sell that. Sell that in the sense that make it relevant. Let people know what I believe. Why I believe the way I believe it. That it is practical. It is biblical. Biblically defensible. It is relevant to our practical needs. So that in every generation that we should be happy about what we believe. And our next generation also should be able to hold on to these very, very uh, important truths. Looking at things through the lens of the scriptures, looking at things through the lens of history, and looking at things through the lens of contemporary needs. 
These are very important things and if we don't refocus ourselves in such a mold and in such a mold in our ministry, uh, we won't be able to accomplish much. So uh, I am deeply passionate about that and I hope you are with me in spirit and uh, uh, in prayers. So we continue with our studies. Uh, uh, I want to just make a statement about the brethren influence. We know that world over the Christian assemblies are a minority. We are a very small group in every part of the world. We are not a very large Christian group. But, uh, you know, when we look at our influence, it is amazing that how God has used such a small community, a small group of believers, in a very extensive and in a very influential way. Since uh, most of us come from India, I just want to give you one example. You know, even in India, we are a very small community, a small minority. But look at uh, who are the best preachers in India. Take care of them, you know. Even all denominations know that we have some of the brilliant communicators of the word of God. Who are the writers? Who have written good Bible commentaries and expositions in India? Not the mainline denominations. Their contribution is very little. If you go to any bookstore, the Bible study materials, the solid ones are, have come from the assemblies. Look at the Sunday school lessons, the Sunday school curriculum. Look at the singers, the musicians, you name it. You know, we are in the forefront. That is because of our unswerving commitment and our enduring respect for the word of God. God honors anyone who honors his word. And because of that, we have that long, wonderful heritage of being committed to the word of God. In spite of our drawbacks and mistakes, God is giving us, God has credited a lot of things to our parents' account. You know, he has abundantly credited it. So many blessings. And the even in this generation, we are reaping the blessings of it. So, uh, that is just an example. And world over, that is true. The brethren influence uh, has been uh, very much seen in many, many different parts of the world. God uses the faithful remnant in every age to accomplish his plan and purpose. The Lord has immensely blessed his people, enduring respect for the word of God. Though brethren assemblies have never been large in number as compared with the great denominations, their influence has been worldwide. Only they have made and they have made tremendous contributions in the area of theology, Christian literature and missions. Brethren is the single most influential Christian group relative to its size. If you look at our size, our influence of surpassed far and beyond above the uh, size of our numbers. Of Wilbraham Smith in the last century was a very influential Bible expositor and a theologian. He was a professor at Moody Bible Institute. This is one of the remarks he has made as a church historian. Of all the groups of Christian believers that developed in the English-speaking world in the 19th century, the one which produced the greatest number of gifted writers uh, was the brethren. So that is a very, very important uh, uh, observation uh, we can make with uh, humility and to the praise of God. Many independent Christian congregations and non-denominational groups have accepted the views of the brethren on, on, on many lines, though they are not openly identified with the circle of brethren assemblies. In world over in my travel, I have found that there are many independent Christian groups, almost like us, but they don't take the name or they are not really associated with the group of assemblies. But the influence of our teaching and writing, uh, you know, have also influenced them because they also, the Spirit of God also have convinced them from the Word of God about the truth of God's Word. We should not overlook the lessons we can learn from history. So both 
positive and negative things what we can learn from history we should not overlook now we come to some of the important distinctives which we have seen you know as a survey we have looked at it now we want to take some very important doctrinal aspects and look at it in in an in depth manner now the assemblies according to what we understand from the scripture we are not a denomination we are non sectarian we are christians and we are saints we are believers we are children of god gathered unto the name of the lord jesus christ our gathering is christo centric you know our gathering is not on the basis of any organization any denominational structure any center any name the only authority and only the center the only banner under which we come is the name of the lord jesus christ let us look at some of those verses that have been very favorite to us and uh, we have cherished that in our history if you can project those verses also that will be good one is matthew 18 verse 20 for where two or three are gathered together in my name i am there in the midst of them that verse is given in the context of church discipline but the lord is reminding us that even when the church even the smallest gathering of the local assembly comes to enforce a discipline in the name of jesus christ you have his authority even the smallest gathering that is why two or three are gathered together in my name i am there in the midst of them my name that is our authority we gather under that name there is no other name among men given you know uh, under heaven whereby we must be saved acts chapter 4 verse 12 uh, yeah uh, let us look at some of the other verses i uh, acts 4 12 uh, if you can go back to the notes and project the other verses uh, uh, 1 corinthians chapter 1 verse verse 2 colossians 3:17 this is a very important verse Paul is writing to the believers in Corinth. Look at how he addresses them. And this is one of the basis of our faith. To the church of God which is at Corinth. No other sectarian name. No denominational name. No sectarian name. Church of God which is at Corinth. To those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Called to be saints. With all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. both theirs and ours so we are part of the family of god called to be saints with all who in every place call on the name of the lord jesus christ so we have a wonderful relationship with all of god's people in the world not necessarily we may agree with them in every aspect of what we believe but through the lord jesus christ if you belong to christ and i belong to christ we have a common bond in the name of the lord jesus christ what a beautiful phrase is that to the church of god which is at corinth you are a church of god you know which is at toronto and we gather together in the name of the lord jesus christ and we have fellowship with the god's people so that has always been our uh, emphasis let us uh, go back to our slides uh christocentric gathering test of faith is scripture alone okay reject the error of phariseeism tradition is always subservient to the scriptures however noble it may be our focus is on the apostolic traditions handed down to us through the word of god now the pharisees they equated their traditions with the word of god and i want to say that in our zeal for the things of god we also have made that mistake that some very good traditions which we keep you know i keep certain good traditions that are taught to me by my parents which i have seen in the assemblies not because it is in the word of god i thought it's a good tradition it's a noble tradition mm. but that is not a part of the word of god but sometimes we don't make a distinction between traditions and the word of god 
Tradition is flexible. It is a negotiable. You may accept it or you may reject it. But the word of God is a non-negotiable. But sometimes we have mixed these two things together. And that has caused a lot of unnecessary headache and a lot of confusion and divisive thinking in many, many places. A tradition, however noble, however good, however important, and how long we have practiced it, it is not the word of God. Uh, let us look at those last verses, 2 Thessalonians, you know, uh, where the word tradition is used. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, 2 and verse 15. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. See, look at how Paul uses the word as a Pharisee, as a Jew. Paul had certain good traditions, which he did not impose upon others. See, we must know that as a Pharisee, like we can say as brethren, or as Christian believers, we have certain good noble traditions. But when Paul wrote about traditions, what did he write? He wrote about the inspired tradition, that is the apostolic tradition, that is the word of God. So when Paul used the word tradition here, in the sense of apostolic tradition, that is, it's another name for the word of God. What did he say? Therefore, brethren, Stand fast, not in my tradition, not in the tradition of Judaism, but hold the traditions which you were taught. How? By our word, by the apostolic word or by our epistle. So that is the tradition on which we stand. That is the most important thing to us. All other traditions are secondary. It is not authoritative. It is not binding on us. No tradition, however good, however important it is, not at all binding on any child of God. We have the freedom to receive it, accept it, or to reject it according to your conviction. But the word of God and the apostolic tradition, we cannot reject. We have to accept it and we have to follow it. So, then uh, chapter 3 and verse 6. Uh, but we command you brethren in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. That is, again he is talking about the word of God, the apostolic tradition. See, many of us have not made that distinction. Look at the way Paul uses the word tradition in the scripture. Mm. He was a Jew. He was steeped in many traditions. And even as a child of God, as a Christian, he might have cherished some of his Jewish traditions in relation to food and other things. But when he wrote about traditions, he is talking about the apostolic truth that has come to us. So I am not here to tell you some of the good traditions of Kerala or what has been taught to me. Mm. I can keep it there for myself. You know, when I am here, I am here to tell you about the apostolic traditions. Mm. And that is what God blesses. Other traditions, we all keep on to some good traditions. Praise the Lord. I consider some of them noble. I have taught them to my children. I have taught them to others. You know, that's a, that's a secondary issue. But look at the way Paul uses it. This should be our emphasis. But in many places, people did not make this distinction and they made a lot of problems in the assemblies for the sake of man-made traditions. Look at our history. You know, all the hair splitting, all the unnecessary seminars conducted, books written. Oh man, some... Uh, when I was in Kerala last year, somebody gave me a book. You know what I did? I said, I don't have time for this. I told him. I have so many other precious things to research and to study. And now I don't have time for this. I'm very sorry. Because he is projecting a very important tradition about which he is so proud. Praise the Lord, you can keep it. You know, that is your prerogative. 
and that is not the word of God. But our energy and effort must be invested in the things of the word of God. I know there are good traditions which we all keep, by all means keep it. I am not saying anything against it, but I am making a distinction between man-made traditions and apostolic traditions. The word of God emphasizes apostolic traditions and it is in that sense Paul uses it. I am biblically defending what I am saying from the scriptures. You know, Paul had many man-made traditions as a Pharisee, but that is not what he was teaching. Dear brothers and sisters, that should be our focus too. Our emphasis is on apostolic traditions. Uh, verse 14, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 14. And if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, know that person and do not keep company with him that he may be ashamed. You know, so the tradition he has already written in the epistle, the apostolic doctrine, either by word of their mouth or by way of uh, the epistle. So that's a very important uh, distinction we make. So what I am emphasizing here is that in our assemblies for the last many, many years, it is a very important part of our heritage. It's a very important part of our Christian heritage. That is, even though we keep certain good disciplines and good traditions, noble traditions, all our man-made traditions or cultural things are subservient to what the Word of God teaches. Word of God is the test of truth. And sola scriptura, the Word of God alone. Shall we go to the next slide? Open and spontaneous uh, priesthood of all believers. That is the next uh, important uh, doctrinal truth which we believe. There is no distinction between clergy and laity in our meeting. You know, like in most denominations have an ordained group of priests or clergy and then the ordinary people. We don't have a distinction like that because we know those verses, 1 Peter 2, 5 and 1 Peter 2, 9, Revelation 1, 6, Revelation 26. If you do not know, those are the verses on the priesthood of believers. We are a royal priesthood and we are a holy priesthood. What is one of the very important distinctions between Israel and the church? Israel had a priesthood. Israel had a priesthood. The church is a priesthood. That is exactly how my father told me once, you know. So it has really got, gone deep down in my heart. Israel had a priesthood. And the church is a priesthood. We are all priests unto God. So the priesthood of all believers means that without any human, angelic or ecclesiastical mediation, without any human mediatorship, we can directly go into the presence of God as priests and offer up our praises, worship and sacrifices to God. There is, so all believers, collectively, we are the priesthood of God. That's a great position. That is why we have freedom in worship. We have freedom in ministry. Jesus Christ is the high priest and our only mediator between God and man. And believers in him together are the holy priesthood. No humanly ordained priest ministers to do the ministry. It is we all do the ministry. Some of us may be doing it, you know, more in certain areas depending upon our calling and our spiritual gifts. You know, that is the only difference. My calling may be different, your calling may be different. My spiritual gifts may be different than your spiritual gifts. So on the basis of those things, our ministries may vary. But all of us are committed to the work of the Lord. All of us are ministers. You know, some of us may be doing it on a full-time basis. But all of us are ministers of God. And there is no distinction between, you know, clergy and laity. That's a very important truth. We are a royal priesthood. We are a holy priesthood without any angelic, human or ecclesiastical mediation. We have direct access into the holy presence of God to offer praise and worship and sacrifices unto His holy name anytime. And that's a great privilege. 
and that privilege was not granted to everyone in Israel. Only the Levites, they were the priests, and the Aaron and his family, they were the ones specially chosen to do the priesthood work. Israel had a priesthood, but the church is a priesthood. That is a very, very important truth. And it is on the basis of that truth that we operate our ministries, our worship, all our activities are based upon this truth. You know, I'm not an ordained clergy who has come here to teach you. I'm a brother in Christ to you. You know, but because of the area of my ministry is teaching and you are recognizing my ministry and the spiritual gifts you have, the Lord has given me as a Bible teacher. And we are coming together to study the word of God. So all our ministry and all our meetings are fundamentally based upon the principle of the priesthood of all believers. And that is the reason that in our worship meeting, we have the freedom to come directly to the presence of God and to worship God. Unswerving commitment to the four pillars of the church. We looked at that yesterday, Acts 2.42, the four pillars of the church. Unswerving commitment. You know, that is, we are always committed. The early church, when they gathered together, why did they gather together? The four important things, the apostles teaching or doctrine, the fellowship and breaking of bread and prayers. And those were the four very important characteristics of their gathering. So we believe in our gathering also, this should be the most important characteristics. So that is why we have the regular observance of the Lord's table. We have, we have emphasis on Christian fellowship. We have breaking of bread and we have prayer and prayer meetings. Now there are other Christian groups also who follow this to some extent, but they miss out on certain things. Most of the Christian churches do not have a, a regular observance of the Lord's Supper. We do that because that's a very clear teaching. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Consistently they were committed to that and to the regular weekly observance of the uh, Lord's Supper. Open and spontaneous worship. You know, our worship meeting is not really structured or ordered in such a way that there is a rigid format. In every place we have a kind of a pattern which we follow for orderliness. You know, it may be, the, the way we do that in Dallas may be slightly different than what you may be doing it here. From assembly to assembly, it may differ. In some places, even in Kerala, like uh, even in Trichur, in one of the assemblies, they have the word ministry first. When they all come together, they have the ministry of the word first. Then they all take a break and then, then they come back for the Lord's Supper. In some places, you know, I have seen in the Western world, in some places, they come together for a common meeting uh, in the morning and for the Lord's Supper, they come together in the evening. In some places, you know, we have like, uh, usually we have first uh, two, three songs, then a time for praise and worship, then meditation culminating in the Lord's Supper. That is probably the typical pattern which we are following. But it should not be a rigid rule. When you go to places, in different places, you see the difference in assemblies. In some assemblies, you know, we are used to reading a psalm, verse by verse, you know, uh, responsively. Uh, in some places, in our assembly, we don't do that. There is nothing wrong in that, you know. And it is good if the Spirit of God leads us to do that. But you know there is a danger. Some people think that if you don't have that reading, it is not really a worship meeting, you know. Uh, I was in an assembly where there was a visitor. He did not know that this assembly had a responsive reading. So, as soon as the singing is over, the visitor got and he started saying. And I could see that they were all very uneasy about it. That means they are totally ignorant of it. Why should you feel uneasy? Because that pattern is broken. Somebody did not read the psalm. Mm. And to, they were becoming very uneasy and looking at like this. You know? I felt so bad. What, what an ignorance is that? Then one of their elders got up. He knew that these people are becoming very uneasy. He got up and said, 
that we had a visitor he did not know that we usually read a psalm responsively but this brother read from the book of romans that is enough you know the spirit of god let us in that way so let us not worry about the reading of the psalm today he was a wise leader and he had scruples and he had guts and he had courage you know otherwise you know probably people would have been very uneasy they did not know what to do what i'm saying is that we should not be slavish to any pattern any order anything which we normally follow it is good to follow there is nothing wrong but if the spirit of god due to any reason wants us to change that little bit for our edification and blessing we must be open to that that's what i'm saying because what we believe in is not in a rigid format of worship some places people tell us that oh we have a written format you don't have a written one but you have one because it exactly goes every week like that that is against what we believe if somebody tells us like that you know it's a very bad testimony we must allow the spirit of god to lead us that is what we believe that is the meaning of open and spontaneous worship so as i told you we need to do some introspection is our worship gathering really spontaneous is it really open we say it is but some of you are smiling you know that it is not you know because we have unnecessarily imposed the things on it so there are certain routines or practices which we normally follow and that is good but if the lord changes that due to any reason or the lord wants us to change that for a for something better we must be open to that let us read that verse and now i want to spend little time here because this is uh, something which we don't normally discuss first uh, corinthians 14 and verse 26 See, we really do not know how the early church worshipped. Is it a shocking statement to you? We do not really know how the early church worshipped. But how do you know? Do you have the details of the worship meeting? No. The only information we have, the only data we have, is in First Corinthians 11, First Corinthians 14. We get a glimpse of. how their worship meeting looked like even though we don't have all the details so we follow that those principles that are clearly mentioned there the details are not given but there are some overarching principles and uh, our worship meeting follows the pattern of those overarching apostolic principles that emerge from 1 Corinthians 14 other than that we really do not know how they worship uh, let us read that verse 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 26 how is it then brethren whenever you come together each of you has a psalm each see that means every person had the freedom you know of course uh, the sisters ministries are restricted uh, later in this chapter so each year definitely means the male members because the public ministry of women is restricted by four uh, in chapter 14 uh, in the following verses so when we take that in the context each male member each of you that means each of you has the freedom for a psalm to read a psalm or in our contemporary context it may even refer to a hymn the word psalm there even mean a christian hymn so most of the christian hymns the early believers used to might have been from the book of psalms so today when we look at it we can say a psalm or even a hymn each of us have the freedom to announce a hymn as we worship the lord then has a teaching you may have a word of teaching to share in the assembly at the appropriate time you have the freedom to do that has a tongue has a revelation some of those supernatural miraculous gifts were in operation in those days so paul mentions them you know some of you may have a tongue 
has a revelation. One may have an interpretation. What is the guideline? Let all things be done for edification. That is the overarching principle. Whatever we do, it should edify the people of God. Edification means building up. Edify one another. And in 1 Corinthians 4, chapter 14, if you read and underline and highlight the word with a marker, edify. When you come together, our primary purpose is to edify one another. So the songs which we sing, the prayers which we offer, and uh, the testimonies which we share, the message which we give, it has one purpose. It should be for the edification of the assembly. If it is not edifying, we should not be sharing that. That is the principle, you know. That is why we say sometimes long prayers are not helpful in the assembly. Because people may be distracted, their attention, they may lose their attention. So in the assembly, in the congregation, when I do something, I have to make sure that it is for the edification of the people of God. Dear brothers and sisters, that is the most important principle in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, in the gathering of the church. That is why Paul tells that even in those days when the gift of tongues was operational, if there is no interpreter, you keep silent because unless there is interpretation, the meaning of what this brother said in tongues, others may not know. So, they, may, they are not edified. So we have to be edifying one another. So how can we practice that today? It's a very important thing. Whatever we do in the assembly, make sure it is edifying. Whether it is we sing, don't sing a song which nobody knows in the congregation. You know, because that's not really edifying. When we pray, we have to be careful. You know, I can pray in whichever format, in whichever way I want, how long I want at home. But when I pray in the assembly, I have to be sensitive because my through my prayer, it has to be edified. When you share something, say it loud, clear, so that people can hear. What's the big deal about it? It's a big deal. Because the principle is, if you cannot edify the, your fellow believers, you don't have to have any right to say anything in the assembly. I want to make it very clear. That is 1 Corinthians 14. Let everything be for the edification of the people of God. It should build up. When we say testimony, you know, that testimony should build up others. I was listening to a person's testimony some years ago. He was... He spent almost 40 minutes in sharing his testimony. 35 minutes he was telling about all the sins which he committed. I was not a member of that assembly. If I were, I would have really called that young man and said, that's not the way to share your testimony in the assembly. Nobody corrected him and I think wherever he goes, that is the foremost he does. Because nobody corrected him. It is not at all edifying. He is highlighting all the dirty sins in his past life. Is that our testimony? Is that edifying? It was very disheartening. It was depressing to listen to that. So what Paul is saying, whatever we do in the assembly, do it for the edification of the people of God. Don't waste other people's time in the assembly. Let me put it that way. If we don't understand it in any other way, I want to make clear that we get the message. That is what Paul is saying. Don't waste anybody's time in the assembly. Time is so precious. People are working Monday through Saturday and even sometimes on Sunday. And it is with great sacrifice that families are coming to the assemblies and meeting. Make sure that we are blessed, we are edified, we are taught by men who are gifted to do such things. And others, even if they are not teachers or preachers, whatever they share, whatever testimony, whatever exhortation, whatever singing, let it really refresh our hearts and draw us closer to our Savior and let it edify us. We don't have permission to do 
anything otherwise in our gathering. You know, 1 Corinthians 14, 26, that is the very important principle, not only about that verse. When you come together, each of you, each of you has the freedom. That is why it is open, it is spontaneous. Nobody can restrict. it, you know. That is why we believe in an open worship. We believe in spontaneous worship. We have the freedom of sharing. But what is the overarching thing? It must be for the edification of the people of God. In many places, this is people forget it and people do not uh, actually practice it. You know, as a result, people are not really edified. One more important thing here. So, what I am saying is, in our assemblies, we follow this open worship because of the word of God, not because Jain are we worship like that or KV Simons are worship like that. Mm. They worship like this because they understood it from the scriptures and that is handed down to us and we are able to biblically defend it. It is in the word of God. We are on the right track and we must practice it. We must follow it. There is a reason. This is not brotherism. This is scripture. And this is the way the early Christians worship. Even though we do not have all the details, we find certain guidelines here and there. Now, look at, uh, you know, except the hymn, psalm, all other things mentioned here are spiritual gifts. That's a very, very important observation. Each of you has a psalm that is praise, worship, you know, uh, a, a hymn, a song. Other than that, a teaching is a spiritual gift. A tongue is a spiritual gift. As a revelation is a spiritual gift. An interpretation is a spiritual gift. What does that teach us? That in an open assembly, our contribution should be on the basis of our spiritual gift. Doesn't that teach you this? That is the overarching principle. That our contribution should be on the basis of our spiritual gift. If you are an exhorter, you know some people when they get up and share something, oh that really cools our heart. It is not big theology or teaching, but it's a word of encouragement, you know. Sometimes in our assembly I pray this brother may get up, you know. He's not a teacher like me. But when he gets up and shares something, I get something for the week. Mm. You know, that is such a comforting, as though the Lord came and embraced me. Why is that? That is his gift the Lord has given me. You know, when some people, when they get up, it is solid, good teaching. Some of them, good preaching, good motivation, good inspiration. So what I'm saying is, our contribution in the assembly should be on the basis of our spiritual gift. Then only the Lord can bless us. If we are not gifted in an area, we should not attempt to do any ministry in that area because that will not really edify the people of God. Now spiritual gifts are not only utterance gifts, speaking gifts, there are gift of leadership, gift of administration, gift of help, gift of showing mercy, you know, gift of giving, so many spiritual gifts, 20 of them are mentioned. All of us do not have all the spiritual gifts, but all of us have at least one spiritual gift. And men and women, brothers and sisters, publicly or privately, personally or silently, we all exercise our gifts. I know that all of you are not, you know, preachers or a teacher like me and come to the pulpit and do this. But I praise the Lord for many of you here and in many other places, those who have ministered to me through their spiritual gift, which I don't have, you know, their gift of hospitality, gift of giving, gift of help, gift of encouragement, gift of counseling, all those things, you know, when we pull it all together, we are edified, we need one another. And sometimes people think that the only you know, recognizable ministry or spiritual gift is speaking. That is why there is great, you know, rush on the pulpit all the time. Because people don't have a right perspective about these things. You know, if I'm not a gifted speaker, this is not the place for me. 
I will be wasting other people's time. You know? Our young people are complaining that world over. I hear that. I get hundreds of emails every day in relation to this. It is high time that we change some of our ministry formats. That's very, very important. Only men assigned and gifted and equipped by the Lord, they are the ones to minister the word of God, period. Let us not negotiate on that. You know, that has become one of the great needs. But word of exhortation, word of small teaching, when we have other occasion, everybody can join in that. But when the whole assembly gathers, which is the only time in which our whole assembly gathers? Sunday morning. Even if you have any midway meeting, midweek meeting, only 30% or 20% of the people come. You know, sometimes I tell people that in our assemblies we need to have good, regular, consecutive teaching of the Word of God. You know, people immediately give the excuse, oh, we have that on Wednesday Bible study. So immediately I ask, how many people come for that? Um, 20, 25. That's not enough. If you have something important to tell it to the assembly, Sunday morning, the gathering of the church, the meeting of the church is the time when everybody or majority of the believers are there. And we have to do the teaching, preaching and all those things with more seriousness on that day. Now, uh, uh, let us turn to 1 Corinthians 11 and I want to show you the importance of the Lord's Supper. Uh, in their meeting. From verse 17 onwards, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 17 onwards, Paul is correcting uh, some of their misunderstanding about the Lord's Supper or the way they uh, celebrated the Lord's Supper. And I want you to underline these words which I am going to highlight. Verse 17. Now in giving this instruction, I do not praise you. Since you come together, See, the word come together. Verse 18. For first of all, when you come together. Verse 20. Therefore, when you come together. Verse 33. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together. Verse 34. But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together. When you come together. The Lord's Supper has a very prominent place in your meeting. That's why I said, what I believe is biblically defensible. I can show that from the scriptures. When you come together, 1 Corinthians 11 from verse 17 is the context of the Lord's Supper. When you come together, the Lord's Supper is something very important. It is not an optional thing. It is not a thing once in a while which you do. Now, 1 Corinthians 14, in the gathering of the church, the same phrase occurs, verse 23. 1 Corinthians 14, 23. Therefore, if the whole church comes together, the context of their gathering together on the Lord's day, verse 26, whenever you come together, coming together, the meeting of the church, that phrase, when you come together, is a technical phrase in the New Testament, for the official gathering of the assembly. The official gathering of the assembly on the Lord's day. So, how, how do we know how they worship? We don't have the details. But on the basis of the information we have, we know that when they came together, their meeting was spontaneous, it was open, the Lord's Supper had a prominent place in it, and in 1 Corinthians 11, or in these chapters that talk about the official gathering of the church. There is no mention of anybody supervising. There is no mention of uh, anybody, any human control over it. It is under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. In relation to the Lord's Supper, elders are not mentioned. Evangelists are not mentioned. So that gives us some guidelines that, you know, that the way we observe we, these things should be under the guidance of the Holy Spirit without any rigid format or without any rigid rules in relation to this. 
So this is all the information we have in relation to the gathering of the church. In the pastoral epistles also we have some light here and there in relation to the gathering of the church. And finally, sometimes, you know, some fine Christian believers who do not observe the Lord's Supper every week, one of their argument is that there is no commandment in the scripture that we should observe the Lord's Supper every week. They are right. There is no commandment in the scripture that we should observe it every week. Then why do we do it every week? When there is no clear commandment in the scripture, the apostolic practice is our rule. The apostles in the early church, they taught and they gathered together on the Lord's day to observe the Lord's Supper. Acts chapter 2 verse 42, Acts chapter 20 verse 7, in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verse 1, the Lord's Supper is not mentioned, but the Lord's Day when they gathered together officially. So the day of resurrection, the Easter day, the early church gathered together and in their gathering the Lord's church, the Supper had a very prominent place. So I know that it is not a direct commandment. When there is no direct commandment, the apostolic practice is our guideline. And the available evidence we have in the New Testament is that when the early church gathered together, when they came together, they always celebrated the Lord's Supper. So we can biblically defend that position also. So we will conclude here and take a short break and then continue with our studies. Thank you, Brother Alexander Gurian.